Hey, it's Bao, and this is Coffee with Bao, where I chat with awesome people about their creative process, their cultural identity, and how they're still growing as a human being. You can find more episodes of Coffee with Bao or support the show at coffeewithbao.com. Duh, where else would you go? So today I'm hanging out with somebody really cool, a fellow Asian American musician. He's a rapper, a poet, an activist. He's performed poetry at the Obama White House. He's had songs featured on HBO and Netflix and more. And he just wrapped up his fifth full length album earlier this year called Living Room. He's got a new single this week or this month called Splash. So here's my friend who also exists at the crossroads between art and activism, the very talented Jason Chu. Hey, what's up, yo, yo, <laughs> Bao? Thank you. We've been trying to make this happen for a minute. Uh, it's great to be here. Let's let's get into it, bro. Yes, for real. I'm so glad we're we're finally here. And um, in honor of our first nighttime episode of Coffee with Bao, we're doing beer with Bao. So cheers, cheers, my guy. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have the lychee beer that all the all the kids are drinking these days. <sighs> Yo, I love that lychee beer. I had it. Uh, my boy had a gallery opening in Chinatown right before, you know, the sickness fell. And uh, that's, that stuff is delicious, man. Shouts to Taiwan. If you know, you know. If you don't, <laughs> look you up that Taiwanese uh, lychee beer. <laughs> Get familiar, for real. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, where are you right now? You're like on the East Coast somewhere. Yeah, bro. So I'm hiding out. I am in Delaware where I grew up. This is uh, my parents' house in Delaware. I've just been laying low, you know, ducking COVID, ducking the cops yep. and uh, <laughs> taking, taking walks. You know what I'm saying? So so when you're in LA, nice. what neighborhood are you in in LA? Yeah, so I, I, I tend to stay towards East LA. I've lived all around like many of us do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I stay in Pasadena right now with, with a couple cool. of the musicians with, with my crew. Yeah, y'all are productive as heck. <laughs> <laughs> thank you we try to you know we try to feed the people i'm remembering way back maybe like two and a half years ago i met you for the first time at a movie premiere with ali shu mm -hmm, and um mm -hmm. you did some spoken word stuff and i was like i gotta know this guy he's mad talented shoot thank you thank you i you know i've one thing that i love the most the reason i moved to la is because we get that community out there you know like you run into people and you just stay in the same circles you know not even intentionally you just you i love it man and i miss that and i can't wait to get back to that you know once we can do so safely but yeah thanks here. thanks for letting me be on your radar <laughs> so you're out in delaware um you grew up in delaware right were you born there too that's right uh so i was born in chicago uh, I was oh. born in Highland Park, Chicago, grew up in Delaware, though. I spent my most formative years from, from like six to 18 mm. uh, out here in the 302 uh, before moving away for, for college. I see. How long has your family been in the U.S.? Uh, so my folks both came in the 70s. Uh, my dad nice. was born in Thailand. My mom was born in Malaysia. Oh, and wow. uh, they came here for college. Uh, they're both Chinese, but they're sort of like Southeast Asian also, you know. Um, whoa, 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 hold on. <laughs> <laughs> tell me more, tell me more. How did all this happen? Yeah, my pops grew up in Bangkok and my mama grew up in uh, KL. So, uh, you know, like, like obviously there's a large Chinese diaspora population there. Uh, my, my grandfather was a journalist. Uh, my dad's side, he was a journalist uh, who, who got out of China right before 1949. So, uh, you know, he, he escaped a lot of the, the wildness there. Mm, and see. then uh, he, he settled in Bangkok. And my mama's family has been Chinese Malaysian. They've been there for like four or five generations. Did they yeah. meet in the States or how did they link they up? They did. They did. So they met at Michigan, uh, which, which is where my parents went to school. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, they met in undergrad. And then, you know, it's just been history from there, you know. So growing up as a like super young child in Chicago area, was there a community of Asian Americans? There was actually, there was. Uh, so we had like, you know, like a, a Chinese church that my parents went to and uh, and helped start. Nice. And, uh, you know, I was very young when I moved away, but definitely, uh, I would honestly actually say more so in my early youth, we were around a lot of Asians. But then when we came huh. to Delaware, you know, Delaware is pretty white. Huh. Uh, I had, had, had pretty diverse friends in high school, but uh, I, I would say Chicago is definitely more diverse uh, than yeah. Delaware. Yeah. And, and it was really only after moving away for college that I really started processing kind of how that shaped me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So in Delaware, as a youngster, were you like a musical person? 
Yeah, I always loved uh, music. You know, I, I played uh, guitar and I tried learning piano. Uh, or, or other way, I, I played piano pretty well. Tried learning guitar, just a little trumpet. Uh, listen oh, wow. to a lot of music. Yeah, I, I was always very into it, but you know how it is. Like, I never thought like, yo, I'm gonna I'm a earn a living from this. <laughs> and uh, it's honestly only been in the last even like year and a half, two years that I've been like, okay, I'm, I'm really gonna earn my living, you know, rest of my life off of these words and, and music. That's awesome. Um, it's been a long journey. Did that start around the church, the music thing? No, actually, is, is the oh, funny thing. Like, I, I played piano at church a couple of times, but even more so, it was just in my extracurricular activities. You know Dude, what I'm saying? Like, that's so cool. listening to music with friends. Uh, my boy Yusef and I would download, he, he was on like ICQ and all that, IRC, so what, he was on IRC <laughs> really early. So what we would do is we would download music and then we had like this little uh, printout that we had that we'd circulate amongst other students being like, yo, we got these albums, we got these movies. And then we'd burn CDs for them, the new CDs that weren't coming out for a week or two. We'd burn CDs for them. So, you know, I was just always, I loved music and, and I loved even more than the music itself, what it meant culturally. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like why people get so excited for the new Jay-Z or the new uh, Kanye or whatever. When did you start performing actually, like being a, a performer? So uh, it's, it's very distinct. Uh, I mean, obviously I had like the little piano recitals or whatever, whatever, right? <laughs> but uh, the first time I ever did rap music in public, it was my junior year talent show in high school. Oh, wow. And uh, you remember that song, Got Rice, AZN? Uh, yeah, so there, there was this uh, MP3 that was going around online, right? It was like a remix of Tupac Changes by uh, some Asian dude, probably in like Cali. Um, it's the AZ and yeah, the rest, Dallas <laughs> to New York, hey, we the best, Vietnam oh, to Japan to Mongolia, Vietnam to Taiwan to Cambodia, Korea. Uh, so, so my boy Alan Chen had that shit on his uh, MP3 player. We were on a field trip and I was like, yo, this is crazy. Because I'd never heard no Asian talking <laughs> like ever in media, <laughs> yeah. right? So I was like, yo, this is wild. This is like one of the first viral things I ever saw in my yeah. life. So Alan Chen, Howie Shen, and I were like, yo, let's do it for the talent show. And both them motherfuckers backed out on me. Both of them were <laughs> like, oh. So I was like, yo, I'm gonna still just do this. I'm gonna thug it out. So junior year talent show at my high school. Because, you know, at the time, I wasn't really known for being a musical dude. Mm. I was just, you know, very academically orientated. So I got out there and, and, and you know, everybody's like, yo, what, what's he going to do? What's Like, I was well known in my high school, but not for music. Yeah. And so, you know, the beat came on. I started doing that. And I just remember, like, all the black girls in, like, the front row, like, just jumped <laughs> on their chairs and were like, what the fuck? This is crazy. Because ah! they never saw me in that light, right? And And that was my first taste where I was like, yo... This music can really move people, it can really change perceptions, and it can really help people see, like, these other sides of me. And from then on, it was on, man. That, that was really the catalyst. Dang, I'm so glad we got there with, with the question, because <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> so after that, you, you got the bug, right, obviously. Mm -hmm. Then you go to school, I mean, then you go to college at Yale or whatever and study philosophy. Were you thinking about music the whole time? So the funny thing is, I was thinking about music the whole time, <laughs> but uh, not as a career. Still never thought I would ever earn a living from this. Never thought that this would be my lifestyle, but I was just doing it nonstop. You know what I'm saying? I was uh, trained as a studio engineer. So Yale, obviously they got a ton of resources. Mm -hmm. but I remember at the time they were just starting to convert old school tape recording studios to digital. So oh, yeah. I was trained as like a recording engineer and it was great, man, because I finessed my way into having a key <laughs> to the studio in my college. So... Literally, whenever I wanted, I could go in and just work. Man, I just, I remember my birthday freshman year. Ooh, I remember I was in the studio and then I got back to my dorm room and it was like midnight and my roommates were like, oh, we got a cake for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, they were like, oh, we're going to surprise him when he gets home. But I was just in the studio all night. <laughs> and, and so I slept in that studio a lot. I brought in the homies to record in the studio. So music was constantly, constantly on my mind. But again, not as like a viable future, yeah. more as just like, yo, I, I got to do this. This is what I love. This is what I feel more at peace here, more myself, more joyful than, than anywhere else. Yeah. When I was at Art Center in my undergrad, I spent like all day and all night in the little music room they had there. <laughs> and one <laughs> of my friends, Karina, was like, man, I hate this guy. He's got this room checked out all the time. Everyone, <laughs> every time I want to come in, this guy has his room checked out. <laughs> yeah. 
But that was when I was recording the Ming and Ping stuff. So I totally feel you. It never felt like there was an opportunity for us to be professional musicians, right? Mm -hmm. It was just something you did because mm -hmm. you loved it. Yeah. Which is still actually, that's advice. So uh, one of my ex-girlfriends, she knew the dude who was the tour manager for like The Offspring and Katy Perry and Shakira. And that was actually the advice he gave me though, uh, ironically, right? It was he was like, before you try to do this for a career, just do it because you love it. Yeah. And honestly, I think that a lot of Asian Americans and a lot of representation discourse pushes people to think like, yo, I got to be a professional. I got to make money. I got to monetize. I got a gig. I got to get merch. And the advice he gave me was like, before you even try doing it for a job, see if it's something you enjoy as a lifestyle, because you, you might love doing it, but hate monetizing it, hate yeah. working at it as a job. And if that's where you're at, it's better to know that before going yeah. in and signing this and doing that. Wow. So I always think about that advice. When, That's when actually really artists. good advice. Cool. Yeah. So I was glad that I was able to really start the foundations of my music and my artistry and my career yeah. from a place that was very natural and, and joyful, you know? Yeah. So you spent some time in Beijing learning Chinese. Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, was that like a, a thing where you felt like you were reconnecting with your roots roots even though your parents are pretty removed from china yeah it definitely was uh so so the deal was i, I grew up not speaking chinese not at all just yeah. fully english at home and i got into college my college had several fellowship programs where you could get money to go to asia yeah. uh, if you were studying an east asian language or southeast asian ang language for that matter and so because you were required to take two years of a language class at my school so, I mean, what am I going to learn, man? I'm not trying to learn German, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, so, I, so, I was like, all right, why not? Mandarin Chinese. And then it was like, yo, there's free money on the table. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're going to write you a blank check for like 10K just to pay for a tuition and a flight and a yada yada. So, I was like, all right, sign me up. So, I wound up cool. studying abroad for two summers. I spent six months of my life in college in Beijing. Met local dudes. We started a rap crew together, running around town, buying Sick. fake Nikes, like everything. It was living the life, man. I'm, you know, just a suburban kid from Delaware. And here I am <laughs> running around with rappers and buying Bape. I mean, this is back when, you know, very vintage, the Sharks just came out, uh, buying my first pair of Air Ones, my first pair of Dunks, because I couldn't afford them in America. You know what I'm saying? In America, <laughs> right at the time, it was cheaper than now, but Air Ones were still like 80, 85 bucks. But I could go to China and on my student fellowship money, my bro, my I put I spent hundreds, maybe a thousand dollars of student fellowship money on kicks and hoodies <laughs> and jeans and uh, and I just loved the culture so much, man. And I dug deep into the rap culture out there, and uh, and that changed my life. You know, oh, I would say if I, I didn't go to Beijing, cool. I wouldn't be rapping right now. That's yeah. cool. Was that your first like real exposure to streetwear too? I know you're kind of a fanatic. <laughs> You did your research, man. I love clothes. I love clothes so much, man. That's my favorite <laughs> form of like curation and expression. Yeah, but it really was. It really, really was. Like, because again, before I didn't have access and I didn't have money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I had this fellowship money, you know, I paid for tuition and a textbook and flight. And then I had like hundreds of dollars left over, maybe a thousand, <laughs> two thousand awesome. bucks. And I just ran every weekend. I just ran around Beijing looking for the the best bootlegs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the best Rolex, the best Bape hoodie, the best neighborhood APC, double taps, whatever. And keep in mind, at the time in America, it was like LRG and Echo. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's cool, but Asia really took streetwear up a notch, right? And and that was when I had the funds and the accessibility. And I started definitely dressing a lot nicer after my sophomore year at college. <laughs> 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 that is crazy. Okay, so the last like decade has been in LA mm -hmm. and has been really about producing a, a huge body of work that is super impressive. Thank you. And performing a ton too, right? Like Yeah, yeah, I gig. Both music and spoken word stuff. And mm -hmm. um to me just reading up on you, the Obama White House poetry thingy seems like a huge milestone. Yeah, um, definitely a highlight. First of all, how was what was how did that come about? So I was uh, invited. I think it was, must have been like 2015, something uh -huh. like that. There was a gathering of Asian American community leaders uh, at the White House, and I was invited in through a person that knew me. 
So she and I had been on a Huffington Post live panel together. And then uh, I performed at, at a gala for her. Uh, this, 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 this woman who's, who's well known in the community, Korean American leader, she invited me to this gathering. So to me, the rule is, uh, as long as it's not the Trump white house, as long as you're invited to the white house, you go, right. You know what I'm (laughs) saying? Like there's never no reason not to. The Trump white house has cheeseburgers from McDonald's though. (sighs) Man, I eat better than that at my mama's house. (laughs) 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 You dig? Um, but yeah, you know, so, so I've been to the Clinton White House before. I've been to the Obama White House a couple of times and just, you know, they had me, they had me share one of my sort of recent pieces then. Um, That's cool. One of the pieces that wound up on my album, Arrivals. Yeah, it was a beautiful time. You know, the administration was very, very caring, very open. You know, they, yeah. they had the White House initiative for APIs and uh, yeah, it was a very meaningful time. That's cool, man. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. So what have other big milestones been or other like fun stories word oh man i got some long stories <laughs> uh there, there was the tom i think where was i at? i was at uh university of missouri <laughs> i did a 45 minute set acapella bro um crazy the uh the av setup that they had was malfunctioning and, uh, and then one of the organizers ran and they got a backup av setup but that was horrible man that shit was horrible <laughs> you know it was one of them little joints with like the speaker built into the mixing board and blah 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 <laughs> and uh so I, I you know as soon as i was like hey like this shit peaked it it clipped it it, it was just not <laughs> sounding nice you know at that point we we're like 30 minutes past like stage time so i was like you know what I came from open mics. I'm gonna go back there. So yeah. I did 45 minutes headlining set a cappella in a student center. That was horrible, man. <laughs> I would not I would not do that now. I mean, I know all the ways to avoid that now. You know, you send over a, a better tech writer, you have your booking yep. manager court, you know, all, all the whatever, but psh, held it down. 45 minutes, student center, couple hundred students just yelling poetry. <laughs> singing my goddamn uh choruses that's like, crazy it was it was awful <laughs> but you know it was it was that's what you do when you sign up the show must go on totally and i man. think that people don't understand that like you got to understand it don't matter what your identity is it doesn't matter how woke your shit is it doesn't matter how technical and complex your shit is you got to entertain you got to make sure that people get the show that they came for yeah and uh, the people walked away definitely with a show that night <laughs> that's awesome Hey, so earlier this year, you linked up with the Slants Foundation, uh, on Heck which yeah. I serve on the board of directors. And uh, the foundation supported a, an album that you were making about your parents' home in Delaware. That's absolutely right. Can you give us like the, the synopsis of what you're trying to do with that record? So the whole uh, point behind the Living Room record is uh, I was back in Delaware. I was moving my parents out of the house I grew up in. And I was sitting there in my old bedroom. It, it was fully moved out. It was bare. Mm-hmm. And I was just feeling like I wanted an album that talked about that feeling of a space you live in. This place that you've inhabited or you do inhabit. And all the feelings and memories that are contained in those yeah. spaces. And, and it was a very quiet album. You know what I'm saying? It's a soundtrack for, for staying at home and lying on your couch or, or visiting your old home or visiting your parents as they get older. So the real backstory is that I'd had the album ready since the beginning of 2019. Hmm. And we just held on to it because it didn't feel like the right time. Then pandemic hit. And that's when I was like, yo, like right now, my team was like, yo, this is the time for that record. Because 2020, everyone's at home. Yeah, Everyone's feeling listless. Everyone's feeling confused people could use something to be the soundtrack to to staying at home and, and worrying about the past and the future and the present um so that's that's why we uh, i reached out to simon i reached out to y'all i reached out to slants foundation and was like hey i got something it's, it's aware and it's socially conscious but it's not angry it's <laughs> not out loud outside music yeah it's like right here yeah. that's what it sounds like too i'm going to show a little image right now Hey. Jason Chu's album is called Living Room. It's stylized as living dot room. It's basically a reflection on, you know, his growth and his homecoming. There's 10 tracks. Jason and his team actually go in and out of a few really cool genres like lo-fi, neo soul, some jazz. Uh, what I really appreciate about the record is Jason's delivery is authentic. It's confident. 
it's dynamic. I just really love the way that Jason balances like very impactful lyrics with a feeling of like ease and unforcedness. You can find Jason and his record at jasonchumusic.com. That's J A S O N C H U M U S I C dot com. Dude, the album's awesome.、Um, I think the concept, you, like you say, it's super timely.、Um, it, isn't it interesting how like, physical spaces are kind of time capsules for your life experiences? Definitely, definitely. Like, I mean, I think about architecture a lot. Like we were saying, you know, you travel in Asia and the whole architecture of places is just set up so people feel different. People encounter each other in different ways. You know, being on the road, touring, gigging, I love seeing the difference between, like, say, a Midwest city versus a Northeast city、yeah. versus, you know, even like a Portland, LA, even like the difference between LA and Dago. Places, physical places really, really matter. Yeah, so, so this is kind of a record about physical space and about the places that we've inhabited and, and the ways we try to find space to make our lives in, in the midst of it. That's awesome. The team that helped you produce the record is actually really impressive as well.、Um, do you want to give a shout out to your team? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's going to take too long to shout everyone out because there's a lot of people around me. There's amazing people around me. First and foremost, shouts to El Yon Beats. Jung Kim is a dope、uh, jazz hop lo fi producer that I've been friends with for years, years and years.、Uh, so he produced the bulk of the album. Definitely shouts out to my team at GGE Media. That's, that's my team、uh, Peter and Kevin and Tina and Grace, Alex, Ashley.、Um, you know, these folks have really been holding me down. That's awesome. And,、um, yeah, my,、uh, and you know, there's so many talented features Uzu Han, my boy Leo Shah, my、yeah. boy Rome, Chance, Samantha.、Uh, but I really, in particular, want to shout out、uh, Joe Kai, you know, another longtime friend of mine, dope, dope Portland based guitarist, vocalist, looper, producer. You know, you don't do nothing alone. This is, this is all people that have been loving and supporting and been in my community for a minute. Yeah, it sounds like it, man. The, the album is. You know, it's the diverse weaving in and out of different sounds. They all get tied together by like this really analog, homey feeling, like super real vibe. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. This, this was my lo fi album. You know, this is my jazzy, like for it's, you know, it's a soundtrack for rainy days. It's a soundtrack for days when you can't go outside. That's cool. You know, I have a similar process in that we start our songs with a concept or a phrase or a title. And you know, with that concept, you can make anything, right? Can, can you talk a little bit about your concept and then rallying those troops around it? Yeah, I think like,、um, so something I always tell younger artists is like, you got to know who you are. Honestly, the number one thing that we can give people as artists is a clear vision. You know、mm. what I'm saying? Because if we don't know who we are, if we don't know who we're trying to be,、uh, can't nobody teach us. For me, especially these days, what I usually do is I'll listen to production, I'll find something that catches my ear, and then、uh, I'll come up with a concept. I'll come up with you know, something loose, that I, a theme or a feeling or, or a message that the music makes me hear.、Mm. And then, based on that concept, I'll write a verse. I'll write the first verse, I'll make sure it sounds tight, find a hook, you know, keep going. But it really does all come down to, you know, like you said, that it feels real. Yeah. You know, that's something just had, like, that's why I love artists like, like a little baby or a young thug, <laughs> Polo G. I'm really fucking with Polo G these days because, you know, these artists, you hear it and it feels so lived in. Like, they feel so. And I think, you know, maybe where I come from, like, you know, being in the Ivy League is very heady, right? It's very, like, top down. But for music, music hits the body first, right? You don't hear music with your head. That's you true. You hear good music with your like, chest. So、uh, for me these days, it's about trying to have that vibrational frequency, that, that great feeling, I think, that I love in music, which is when you can't even make out the words, but the urgency in the voice and the authenticity、yeah. in the voice makes you go, I want to know what the words are saying. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? That's something that I strive for. And that's something that I think my collaborators are attracted to. And that's what keeps us working together is they know that I'm real with it. Yeah. yeah. The first line, actually, in your song, Influencers. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, I'm going to read it. I got lost in LA for a hot second. All my life goals turning into life lessons. Seen viral success turn into second guessing. Yeah.、Uh. 
<laughs> no, I mean, that's just real. Like I've been, you know, I've been in the game a little minute now. I've seen people who've been up. I've seen people who've been down. I've, I've had little viral successes and then I didn't book shows for two months mm-hmm. and I've, you know, stayed true and didn't put anything out, but people came knocking. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got that. That's, that's some LA lessons right there. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about staying true. I mean, something I really appreciate about your work is you've always been about representation of the Asian American lifestyle and the Asian American identity. You've always had the courage to call out for racial justice in your work. I think it takes courage to do that, to build your entire music persona around those topics of identity and activism and stuff. And um, I was wondering if there has been any missed opportunities or negative repercussions from doing that. I mean, I've been very fortunate. I've been very blessed. I would say there really hasn't been uh, just because that's who I am. So this was something that I remember MC Jin told told me and my guys early on. Jin was like, yo, make sure that the success you're se- setting yourself up for is the success that you want and can live with. Ooh. Right? So, I mean, he didn't say it in that many words, but that's, that's what I took away from it, right? Because I was out in Beijing. He was in Hong Kong. You yeah. know, we had mutual friends and whatever. So a buddy of mine, uh, David Fung from the Fung Brothers, actually, he went down to Hong Kong and, and, and they were chopping it up. Basically, David came back to Beijing off that and he was like, yo, man, I think I got to go back to the US. Like, you know, I'm not trying to like repatriate to Asia yeah. and, and live in Asia and do Lipton tea ads. Like, you know, <laughs> I really want to be in America. And I would say similarly for myself, I could try moving in a different way. I could try carrying myself differently. I could try making different music, saying different things. But in the end, like, it's going to be false. You know what I'm saying? Like, in the end, cool. What if I got, like, 500K views, 1.2 million plays off of something like that? But I'm not going to do another one and another one and have another career. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think you can build a hit off of fronting. But you yeah. can't build a career off of capping. Woo! You know Jason what I'm saying? Jason Chu dropping some gold yeah. nuggets today. Sheesh. Right? Because because worst <laughs> best case scenario, you get money. <laughs> which, you know, if you need money, sure, do what you got to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you need to feed your family, do what you got to do. But, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm doing okay for myself. And what it takes to sell out is, is not worth the stress of, of living that whole building my empire on the back of like something that's not me wow Um, man so i would say yeah overall it's worked out overall my career is is healthy thank god because i think of that consistency i love it that's super inspiring i'm gonna show your next single check this out guys for the podcast listeners you can't see this album cover but it's jason on a surfboard (laughs) (laughs) shouts to tin Hua, man that's my creative director he put that 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 cover together jason chu's body of work is so massive that it's hard to just recommend one thing to y'all but uh, his latest single is called splash the hook is i'm asian i hustle Ain't none of this subtle. <laughs> <laughs> you can find Jason at jasonchewmusic.com. To me, that song really isn't about hustling or making money or success, actually. To, to me, when I listen to it, I think it's about charting your own path when, when none exists. And what's impressive about your career is that that's all you've been doing this whole time. And it's just crazy how being real has paid off for you. Yeah, I've I've been fortunate, you know, like I start the record, I say, aim for the top, but I know my position. So I just keep playing the cards in my hand. I was a young and I moved. So I didn't have any family friends. Like, I, I, obviously, I want to blow up. You know what I'm saying? I'd love to to sell more. I'd love to stream more. I'd love to, you know, notoriety and, and, and the possibilities that come with it. Yeah. But I know what I'm holding on to. You know what I'm saying? I know I know the hand that I've got. And, and that's something that I'm that I'm going to play. Um, so is yeah. long-term success for you just to be a viable creative for the long run? Or do you have any other um, more concrete ideas of success? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd love to get my streaming numbers up. You know, I got a couple thousand <laughs> people listening right now. I'd love to get a couple hundred thousand, you know, like that's always, yeah. you know, we make stuff and we always want people to hear it. My ultimate goal really is just to shift the culture. And so I don't got to do that by being the biggest selling or the biggest streamed. There's a lot of young artists that I respect. These young Asian American artists and voices 
that I see really popping. And, you know, we, we, we talk. And much shouts to my boy, Alan Z, you know, in Atlanta. That's, that's my partner for real. Because, you know, I also have a background in Asian American studies and Asian American theology. And nice. so I think, you know, if, if I can leverage this kind of academic awareness and translate it into art and culture and pop culture... That's, that's all I want, man, is, is to make sure that we elevate the culture and our communities and make sure that we're making dope shit that feeds people. And I think, you know, if I can have that impact on other artists, on the people that come to my shows, that's a win condition for me. That's is awesome. if, you know, by the time I die, I help shift the culture in the direction of what I consider is positive and necessary uh, for, for progress. You just answered my next question about legacy <laughs> and, and lasting impact so sir i know your breadth of, of skills and your experience and you know all the things that you've studied and um because of that i suspect that you're not just making songs and poetry and playing shows <laughs> 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 what, what are you working on exactly now can, i'm working on share? some fire outfits you know what i'm saying i got oh, the wow. uh i just got the new uh bodega dunk highs got the balenciaga triple s's for the low <laughs> Got this vintage hoodie from my pops from our Kung Fu school. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm working on, bro. I'm working on putting together some good looks. Um, no, I'm sorry, I'm playing. Um, <laughs> what am I working on? These days, music, building my team. Shouts to GGE Media, GGE.media. That's my little artist services team. We, uh, oh, cool. you know, we provide different services to different... We, we've got a couple artists with us right now. That, that I really love and respect their output and work. Shouts to Leo Shah, shouts to Fictitious Professor, shouts to Night Market. Um, yeah. so, so we're working on making sure that their shit cracks. Again, it, it goes back to building community. It goes back towards giving back, right? Just trying to take the fruits of what I learned, putting it out there. Uh, I'm finishing my master's degree in Asian American theology. So, you know, just wow. trying to stay educated, trying to stay aware of cutting edge thoughts so I can and translate that into music. I'm a simple man. I tell my friends this. I'm a simple man. All I want to do is make good music and wear good outfits. That's, that's really, <laughs> that's really awesome. all I'm trying to do. And, uh, oh, and then, you know, activism. That, that's something I say. Other than outfits. Uh, <laughs> I, I think if you talking woke, but you ain't living woke, you're not woke. Definitely trying to stay active around things like, uh, you know, I'm not sure when this episode is going to air. But uh, there's there's like a white nationalist Christian dude who's trying to come to Skid Row, do this maskless outreach thing. Oh, and, uh, you know, so so my boy, Pastor Q from the Skid Row Church, Church Without Walls, he's uh, organizing a resistance to that. Just saying, you know, we're not going to let them do that to our people. Um, things like that. Just rest in peace, Breonna Taylor and, you know, Ahmaud Arbery and, and, and George Floyd. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, definitely in solidarity with that anti anti ice these deportations of cambodians and vietnamese and mong got to stop you know that that's where i put some time and energy and, and and finances into is trying to trying to support the people that are hurting yeah you know i yeah. love that hey uh i have a confession to make hey, um, hey. I, I had heard your song this is asian american before <laughs> yeah the first time i saw the music video you made I teared up, man. Shoot. Thank I, you. I, I teared, I teared up when the guy turns around and he sees himself hanging. And I was like, that's real. And it's from Thank all you. sides, right? All that pressure is from every angle. And uh, that's why that hit me so hard. I was like, wow, they thought about this video. They didn't just go out and make a video. Shouts to my boy, Michael Tao, man. Shouts, shouts to uh, my boy, Taya Arboleta. Those guys are incredible, incredible filmmakers, just really smart, kind, thoughtful dudes. Uh, Tower Boleto Films, they stay going viral because they they think, you know what I'm saying? They aren't just trying to make like, oh, a coronavirus, but they like really trying to give you something with heart. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I flew out to Boston and we did that. And I'm really, really glad it touched you, man. I'm really glad it spoke to for you. For real. You know, we talked about doing this, all this other stuff for your music for your activism, for other people. What are you working on for you? Just these fits, man. Got to look fresh, man. <laughs> Got to get some good socks. So I've been, I've been sleeping a lot these days. I, I told myself I wouldn't work, uh, you know, over oh. the holidays uh, for the first time in a long time. Just take a step back and reevaluate. You know, I watched Wonder Woman 1984, which I actually enjoyed a lot. 
Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, I go into movies wanting to enjoy them, wanting to learn something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't go into movies trying to have a cool, sassy take for Twitter. Yeah. You know, and, and that movie spoke to me. So I've just been trying to learn how to do better, learn how to live into my moment. You know what I'm saying? Where, wherever I am right now, that's what I'm trying to be. And and we can get distracted, I think. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm all about st- strategy and focus and branding and vision. Now, anybody that works with me knows that. I'm, I'm very, very aware of the need to, to be strategic. But, you know, right now I'm trying to just give all that up and listen and, and see what 2021 is going to bring, you know, instead of trying to project myself into 2021 and be like, yo... Uh, I want X and Y and Z. It's like, yo, where, where's where's the world at right now? What's the needs of the moment? Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do right now is just listen. Wow. I'm going to take that as inspiration and, and do a little <laughs> bit of that too. <laughs> Hell yeah. So, you know, I think that you've earned, like for real, you've earned the respect of your peers, your contemporaries, including myself. And like we were talking about, it has a lot to do with your authenticity and consistency. And um, I was wondering if you have a technical approach that helps you kind of stay within where you want to go. That's a good question. I mean, you know what I'm writing in terms of strictly writing and lyrics. I've just been trying to to become more critical, like develop a more critical ear. Uh, I was just writing a feature verse today for my buddy. So I'll write a line and then I'll say it back and I'll try to listen to it and be like, yo, does that sound real or does that sound like i'm just trying to write a cool line yeah and this is something that i love right now is that hip-hop has become less technical and more soulful Mm. i mean not that hip-hop lacks soul before but my favorite rolling stone review of eminem it was like a retrospective on eminem and i remember the, the the journalist said eminem took his success and took all the wrong lessons from it you, you know, where Eminem's music is now is technically dazzling, but it means nothing. And people loved Eminem when he came out because he was real. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He was really talking about struggle. He was really talking about pain. He was really talking about thoughts he had. And then people validated that with platinum sales. And now he was like, oh, so that just means they want me to rap harder and faster and louder and better. And it's like, no, nobody wanted that, man. People just wanted you to make music that like spoke to them. <laughs> like the best music these days is something that you just feel and and you can't let go of, you know? So, so these days I'm really trying to take that lesson to heart. If I can just give people a melody or a hook or a flow that like fits into their life, like a soundtrack, like, you know, I want to work out to this. I want to drive to this. I want to recover from a breakup from with this. I want to, you mm-hmm. know, leave my parents' house and drive to the airport, play this. That's the gold standard for me right now. That's awesome, man. I'm really glad we made this conversation happen because it's, uh, you know, I've been wanting to chat with you like this for a long time. Hey, podcast is the best way to do it, bro. Well, we get to see your beautiful face too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. All right, brother. Um, thank you so much for... Um, you know, making time to share your thoughts. I, you really did drop some gold nuggets today. Stay on the line for me, and then I'm going to give a little outro, and I'll be back to say a proper goodbye to you. Hey, let's do it. Awesome, dude. Whoa, my guest was Jason Chu. He's awesome. <laughs> Jason's latest single is called Splash. Earlier this year, he put out an album called Living Room. You can find Jason at jasonchumusic.com. If you enjoyed our conversation today, you can support me by subscribing to the show or sharing it. Also, if you can financially support the show, head over to coffeewithbow.com. There's a big blue button that says support and you can buy me a coffee. How cool is that? Thank you so much for having coffee with Bao. And tonight, since it's our first nighttime, beer with Bao. See y'all. 